Hello, and welcome to the next episode of Lost in Criterion. We are your hosts, John Patrick Owatari Dorgan, and... I'm the Adam Glass. Today, okay, Adam. Yeah. Oh. Well, I'm just... I was gonna. I was gonna do the intro for like. So, Adam, tell me, what's our <laughs> film for today? Well, that works, Pat. You know, someday, someday, listeners, we'll uh, figure out the actual format yeah. of our show. We'll and actually have it all this. together. Uh, considering, no, I is... don't think we will. It'll just evolve. This is like uh, episode forty. If people into are like still a buck tooth lizard man of, yes. a, of a podcast. <laughs> anyway, today, uh, as I said last episode, we were talking about David Lean's second adaptation of Dickens' work. Um, this time, uh, it's Oliver Twist, the first film adaptation of Oliver Twist. Uh, not the musical you might be familiar with, though apparently a bit of an inspiration on that. Uh, it's pretty Well, clear. considering they take the same source material, <laughs> well, I, I don't mean, know how you could A little more directly an inspiration. Than... Oh, okay. Uh, well, I've uh, never seen the musical either, so I yes. don't know. Well, uh... The scene, the scene where Fagin's teaching everybody how to pickpocket, or teaching Oliver how to pickpocket, plays oh, a lot yeah, the same because it that. kind of plays like a comic ballet in this movie. Yeah, it had a weird, for just a short moment, had a very much like, had a very musical know, slapstick fear. comedy, yeah. like, oh, we're about to break into song, look about it. Last week, uh, when I was when I was saying that this was up, and I was talking about uh, we had been talking about how great, great a uh, adaptation of Great Expectations that movie was, um, I said that we'd probably end up having a very similar conversation this week. But as it turns out, I, I really I wasn't even thinking. I've never read Oliver Twist. I don't think you have either. Me neither. No, <laughs> yeah. I have not. Um, so my familiarity with Oliver Twist is uh, is the musical Oliver and uh, the uh, the cartoon adaptation Oliver and Company about cats in New York City. Oliver <laughs> Twist is, for me at least, one of those stories where I, I know the plot. Yeah. But I don't recall having ever seen any yeah. material, any recreation of it, in it's any kind of, form. It's kind of a, a cultural, uh, right? Memory, and I guess. Even to, down to the names of the characters. Yeah, yeah. it's weird. Well, it was. I, very... I realized that. The... I was watching. It, I'm like, I know what's going to happen, and I don't <laughs> know why. Well, it it is kind of a cultural memory in that the story was so popular at the time when it came out that uh, you know Fagin became the term for that member of the of the underworld community the the kidsman is what they had been called previously uh, the yeah, guy yeah. who who recruits urchins um they became called fagans so it it had it had a pretty major impact and obviously you know this is one of dickens well one of dickens <laughs> dickens had a, had a tendency to to uh you know very much show the nitty-gritty of the real world for the underclasses. Yeah. Um, and there was a lot of, you know, reaction to that in, is it really that bad? You know, so so in that, too, it became, I think. Um, but I talk about how, we had talked about how, um, you know, there's such great adaptations, less... To, to make a joke about how neither of us read this, and more, I, I want to get this out of the way to start, because it's something that it seems a lot of reviewers ignore or try to downplay. One of this movie's biggest flaws, I think, is one part in particular, one aspect in particular, that it is very close to the source material on, and that is how stereotypical Jewish Fagin is. You know, I I really kind of just glossed over that in my viewing. Yeah. Uh, um, because I, yeah, I don't know. The, yeah, the, you are you are right. Yeah. He the, might as also he might as well also have a uh, 
a copy in his hand of yeah. like <laughs> the priories know. of Zion. Yeah, yeah. That's it's, I was I was hunting for that. But yeah. like of course that wouldn't make any sense because you know he, he's about yeah. as poor as they come, but Yeah. Um the uh okay, Fagan Okay, I'm gonna introduce this. The back of the DVD case I had called <laughs> called Alec Guinness's called Alec Guinness's portrayal of Fagan controversial. And I turned to my roommate and and I read that and I said, My goodness, the only way I can think of Fagan being controversial is if this is so terribly anti Semitic. <laughs> um, oh, before you watched it. Before I watched it. And then I, and I, boy, I, were you right. I put the DVD in and I watched the, the trailer, the original trailer is on, and I saw Alec Guinness as Fagan. And his nose is, is, his nose is six inches long. Yeah, well, it's, that's where it gets kind of absurd. It, it it's is, like, it is absurd, it is some, caricature. Right, but you it can is, expect some casual anti-Semitism, <laughs> I can't say, yes. I can't figure out how that word is formed, um, in, in this kind of thing. That's not that surprising. It's it's the fact that they almost took it yeah, almost to a satirical extreme. And I'm wondering <clears> if it's a con- I'm wondering if we or anybody who calls it controversial might be misinterpreting it as a what is actually a more satirically chosen yeah. I don't stylistic think it's, choice. I don't think it's satire. It's definitely caricature, I but I don't think it's satire. And and, and I'll, well, but I'll, what, the difference between caricature and satire yeah. is a pretty fine <laughs> line. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. You're right. Now, when this movie came out in '48, um, the Anti Defamation League and the New York uh, Board of Rabbis both objected to it on anti-Semitic grounds and successfully petitioned to have its release delayed for three years in the U.S. Um, and uh, when it was finally released, there was a full 12 minutes cut, mostly of shots of Fagan. Well, I don't understand why... Wh- <clears throat> I do understand 100% why they would want to do that. Yeah. Like, and get it delayed, but what's the point in cutting anything out? Every, um, every moment he's on screen... <laughs> Yes, is anti-Semitic. Well, it was. It was. I think it was mostly like uh, kind of uh, trailing shots on him, and maybe maybe him going through his jewelry. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't I know what was that. cut. We would if we if you watched the Criterion edition, and I, I know I did because it was on the DVD. I don't As know how you I. ended up watching it. Um, uh, you. Uh, we watched the full cut. I mean, we didn't see anything. But but any objections? Um, and uh, and obviously, it's see the thing is, it's Alec Guinness, and I know what Alec Guinness looks like. So I know that oh, Alec yeah. Alec Guinness having a nose where the nostrils themselves are three inches long. Um, <laughs> that's you know, and and playing it in a humpback Hasidic portrayal. It's just very. Um, but it's based. It is unfortunately based on very much in the work itself. Um, when Dickens, and you know, Dickens wrote this the same way he wrote everything. It was episodic. It was you know periodical, released in magazines right. or whatnot. Um, so in the first uh, first like thirty eight chapters, Fagin is referred to as the Jew or the old Jew two hundred and fifty seven times, and he's referred to as Fagin or the old man forty times. So um, did he just change his mind? At that point, why I say the first 38 chapters or so, um, he sold his house in London to a Jewish banker. And it was such a pleasant, surprisingly pleasant experience for him uh, that he... Uh, uh, casual anti <laughs> Yes. That he became good friends with the banker and his wife. And in conversation one night with them, uh, they said, well... We got a little bit of a problem with Fagan. And Who is not Fagan at this point? <laughs> well, he was. He was, he was named Fagan oh, at this point. Okay, well, because I mean, the old yeah. Jew, I thought maybe. <laughs> well, yeah. the old Jew. He had a name, but he just wasn't. He was referred to it as the as the old Jew much more than Fagan. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so you know, uh, Dickens had a change of heart in that conversation, and in the last, you know, he. In the last uh, 
few chapters, he ended up, you know, editing out more and more references to Fagin's Jewishness so that it kind of just falls off the, uh, falls That's off really the boat by the end of the book. Uh, and then, and then later in, oh, I can't remember what work, but a few of his later works, he does very, very positive portrayals of Jewish characters just to kind of atone for what he'd done. So, you know, the, the fact that there's a, uh, given how closely David Lean's Great Expectations was to the book, I think the Anti-Defamation League might have been already on the lookout to to have problems right. with, a, with a strict interpretation. But Alec Guinness's character, his, his, his makeup is still still very much over the top. And I cannot, yeah. I cannot as, as much as what I just said, them on the lookout for being offended might suggest no this move his his makeup is still very much in his <laughs> yeah and it's weird because it's kind of unnecessary because anything that they wanted to get across to be strictly adhering to the book could have just been done with acting yes the makeup yes. is unnecessary yeah or you know just you can the make him absolutely you know all those stereotypes <clears throat> out yeah and you can without having a six inch long nose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it's just, um, yeah. So one more, one more note on that. Uh, I have read, and I cannot, I have not found anywhere to independently confirm this. Um, the only reference to it I have found is in a a Guardian article from two thousand one, which was strictly Alec Guinness's top ten film roles, and number ten was as Fagan in. Oliver Twist. Um, the writer of that article claims, and he doesn't back it up, and I'm, again, I've not been able to find this information anywhere else, but he says that the film was banned in Israel for being anti-Semitic, and also that it was banned in Egypt for portraying Fagan too sympathetically. That so sounds... Ban- banned in awkward. Egypt for not being anti-Semitic enough. That sounds, yeah, not true. It sounds too good to be true. But it's still hilarious. So I want it to be true. And in my mind now, that's true. That's true. true. Okay. So, about the actual film <laughs> itself. Okay. Now that, we've, now that we've gone on a 12 minute long this is, discussion this is not of a, Fagan. Yeah, this is not a tangent, because this is very integral to the film. Yes, I understand. <laughs> but I think we've, we've nightly, nicely packaged up the entire <laughs> Fagan thing. Yeah. yeah. He is... <laughs> Hyper stereotypical. Yes, he is. Stringy hair, beady eyes, long nose, holding a box full of jewelry that he counts yes. in secret by yes. candlelight. By yeah, candlelight. sure. Well, of course, by candlelight, because how else is he going to count it? Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's uh, whew, man. <laughs> well, crazy. Now, interesting, here's a, interesting. here's a, I have a problem. Okay. Okay. And I with this movie that I did not have with Great Expectations. I found the pacing in Great Expectations fine. I it, it didn't feel like it sped up or slowed down too much at any given time. I found the pacing in this one a bit much. A little too fast. I don't know the books, okay? So I don't know what we're working from. But again, if we're just judging it on pure movie merits, yeah. I felt like we were rushing there From was moment to moment. There was like a we lot. were in a dead yeah. race to get to the end of the film. Yeah. Well, there's a lot to cover, and you know, even even here, he makes some you know con- conservative edits. You know, that he yeah, uh, and I and I, wonder, and I well, I, and I understand. Yeah, you're when you're dealing with Dickens, you're dealing with like thousands of pages of material to condense into an hour, two hour, well, hour and a half, two hours, or whatever it was, two hours, I think. But it really, in my mind, could have benefited from just a few more pauses. Yeah. I think one one issue where that one issue where that really comes to head is Nancy's motivations. Yeah, man, she comes yeah. off as a crazy person. She comes off as a crazy person who very suddenly and without warning and without reason decides that she wants to help Oliver. Yeah, and that's what I'm talking about. Like, yeah. Well, and then like. Yeah, I understand that Oliver, you know, he, you know, his reaction at the end doesn't feel natural because he's only spent, like, 
and from what as far as i can determine from the movie about 45 minutes with these people <laughs> yes and uh, you know a little more than 45 minutes but he was asleep the entire time yeah right like it's like really hard to like judge the time frames the things are happening especially without any sort of lapsing of time like i mean especially with the way the film is shot it's feels kind of dark all the time and so you're like and i understand that's a that's a thematic thing right this is london during a time where ever and 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 the dark places are dark and then that manor is bright and beautiful and i understand that but it also takes away from any sense of time passage for me and so i'm like i don't know how long anything is taking yeah yeah and that's and, a problem and, you know maybe even a sense that that nancy and and he knew each other longer would have would have helped right, on that helps, end. Yeah. but literally we have her like meet him uh Go along and try kidnap to... him. Yeah, and, and then, then within him. minutes decide to like yeah, the, change of oh, heart. D- don't don't hurt him. Uh, yeah, like, so that's and maybe the thing. you can read in a lot about the motherly thing or whatever. Well, yeah, you know, like, change I can of accept heart, the but... not hurting him thing, but then the selling out her. Yeah, which yeah. she doesn't actually do. That's another thing is like she doesn't actually sell him out, but then. And so yeah, that's think, kind of they a think fa- he's they selling think, him out. Yeah, yeah, and that's mostly Fagan's doing and. That all that and I, that I mean that doesn't upset me too much, but yeah, there's just a lot of reactions where you're like, man, I don't. It feels nearly instantaneous, which doesn't yeah, seem right. Yeah, very, very. Which, much which one came? Which one came out first? Great Expectations or? Great um, Expectations came out first. This is the fall. Which is weird because Great Expectations pacing, no problem. I felt the time, yeah. the passage of time. Well, you know, it, it helps. It helps that there's aging. In That's Great true, and Oliver Twist, there's no aging, so yeah, there's no real aging. I mean, but you we know, start, we, obviously we start with him as a baby, but then we jump to him being nine years old, and maybe he's ten or eleven by the end of it. Yeah, but we really he's like don't know. turning ten, maybe or something. <laughs> yeah, but but yeah, but by the pacing of the film, it looks like it was four days later. Yeah, it it looks like from the orphanage to the end of the movie. <laughs> It's, it's been four days. Yeah, I mean, like, like you can get a little bit of a sense with the coffin maker. Yeah. Because he yeah. sleeps a couple times, and you're like, oh, so that's, if we multiply that by movie magic time, <laughs> that's yes. maybe a, at least a couple months or something. But Probably, then, yeah. But as soon as we get into the city, as soon as we get into London, time just loses all meaning. Yes. And I'm like, oh, we're, huh? like, so he met these people, fell in love with them. And gets kidnapped in an hour and a half? Thereabouts. Hey, they, they had enough time to give him a bath and put him in nice clothes. Right, so what, two hours? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, probably. Considering considering how long he'd been on the street and in the orphanage, I imagine it would take a pretty long time. Quite a long time him to wash him. Yeah. Oh, he's probably uh, never going to be clean. <laughs> Not really. No. He's no, damaged he's, goods. Uh, he is. No, I just it, that that was my biggest problem with the film. Like I enjoyed the film because yeah. it was everything I expected Oliver Twist to be. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like it, I've never seen. Like I said, any as far as I know, I've never seen any media of Oliver Twist, and uh-huh. it matched exactly what was in my head for the story <laughs> and what everything should look like. Except for Oliver was always a little bit too clean, even when he was dirty. That is true. And that bothered me a little bit, but I think that was just uh, he's, make, to he's, make him stand out from the other street urchins a little bit. Otherwise, it would just be like, look at that other grimy-faced child. Well, yeah, it's also this whole motif of him as angelic. And, yeah. You know, one thing one thing they also don't mention in this movie is that part of the condition of his inheritance um, at the end is that he never actually committed a crime. Um, oh, really? And that's... You know that's never that's never explicitly mentioned in the movie. It's kind of maybe hinted at if you read too deeply into a few things, but uh, um, but it is a condition in the book. Um, and uh, well, and, that, know, also, that would actually explain some of the motivations of the the mysterious yeah. bad guy who's never properly introduced, and I don't know what the hell he's doing. Um, but like I guess for trying to get him involved in this crime yes. thing, yes. that makes and that actually makes the movie make more sense. That does, yeah. And that would have that, been really helpful that's another, information. That's another fellow whose motivations are very muddled. Because oh of, man, I do not of, understand that guy at all. I'm like, yeah. who's this d bag? And then like he just <laughs> seems to be evil without yeah. any sort of and like you know again I've not read a, very much Dickens at all, but yeah. 
I, I know, he, I but I don't know how much he gets into character motivations, but I can't imagine him writing a story where a dude is just evil for no recognizable reason. He'd at least have an evil name. Right, yeah. exactly. What was the, what um, was the bad guy's name? I don't even know. I cannot remember his it's name. It's like Murdoch. Really I'm just going to go with Murdoch. I think it's... I think it, it very much might be. Which Something means, you like know, that. We've got, we've got murder. Yeah. <laughs> Murdoch's a good name for him. Sure, even we'll call him Murdoch. actual name. Anyway. Um, one, of, one of the things in the original is that uh, Oliver's mom, I don't think, is the old man's daughter or daughter-in-law. Um, I think I think it's like a, a niece, uh, a good or a good friend, and uh, uh, yeah, but it's easier to follow if it's just his daughter. It's much, yeah, it's much easier. That's a very good cut if if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, because I mean anything yeah. like if, as soon as yeah. we get into extended family, it would be like, yeah, huh? Well, because I mean, we would end up in a similar situation of like the bad guy in this film, where we're yeah. like, I don't know why these people are doing these things. Well. The- the the point is that there is more of an equal claim between him and Oliver. To, oh, okay. To the, right because uh, if it's just the, the it's the daughters or if it's the grandson yeah. versus like Joe Schmo who <coughs> hasn't been properly introduced. Yeah. Uh, it's like Dude, yeah, who's this there? I yeah, think he's well, like a cousin or something. I don't even know. Anyway, um, so uh, so yeah, he stands. His his motivation is that he stands to lose the inheritance. Now, the old man then says, you know, you were never going to get it anyway to him in the movie. Um, and I don't know how true that might be. But it is... See, and, it's, I, it's, and I kind of wonder about that because him, I don't but. think that would have been a theme in the Dickens book. And the reason why is, as far as I know, because certain states in the United States still operate this way, for most of history... Inheritance was not by the will of the people giving the money. Like, um, a lot of it was automatic. Yeah. Especially in more, uh, especially around these times. Like, as far as I know, and I could be wrong, but I've, I think I've read something about it or heard it mentioned before that they didn't get to designate who got the money. Yeah. I mean, they could set a will of what to do with the money. And give some of it to somebody, but the point is, is that the uh, that like it was not the law designated. Like who gets yeah, the money, right, the, right, exactly. Yeah. It would be the inheritance itself would go to the person that is set up in the law. Yeah, yeah. So I don't, I don't know. Um, maybe I'm misremembering. Maybe that seems you more don't like a. Know, well, but... I don't know, but it, that seems more <laughs> like a 40s and 50s. We want to make this movie just a little bit more. Maybe moralistically then, poignant. Yeah, whatever, whatever the deal. We don't get enough of that guy's motivation. Right. I don't even know what he's doing until like the last yeah. fifteen minutes, where I'm like, oh, he wanted the inheritance. That kind of makes sense. Yeah. Like, I mean, I kind of cued into it after he was hunting down the locket. I was yeah. like, okay, he's probably somehow connected. But I'm like, is he the one who's going to get the money? Is he working for somebody who's going to get the money? Who's this funny? Weirdly leprechaun looking man in a bar. Uh, <laughs> is, yeah. Speaking of racism, that uh, was weird. That guy's face was weird. Yes, yes, it was. Uh, was he intentionally of, supposed to be an Irish stereotype? I probably. Okay. Uh, maybe. Maybe it was also Alec Guinness. <laughs> Every <laughs> stereotype in the movie was Alec Guinness. <laughs> He does like to play multiple roles sometimes. <laughs> I know. It was just... Yeah. I felt... If you combine the pacing with the fact that some of the characters are not introduced in a way that makes sense... Yeah. This was it not was as good of a go. movie as Great Expectations. Yeah, the fact, the like, fact Great that Expectations, so intently... Having watched Great Expectations, I feel like, oh, well, I've got it now. I know what Great Expectations... I didn't even need to read the dang book in whatever... 11th grade or whatever... But this one, I'm like, Ooh, okay, I don't know why people are doing the things they're doing. Maybe I need to read the book. And then I think, oh my god, the book is 2,000 pages long. <laughs> it's like 45 chapters. It really is. It's, uh, you know, they're, they're not hugely long chapters, but they're still 45. Fill up my Kindle <laughs> with one book. Yeah, yeah, it is. Whew. 
Well, that won't that won't quite happen, Pat. Let me explain. Yeah, considering the file cons- sizes considering and... that, that like the <laughs> it would be maybe eighty k. It was yeah. a joke, Adam. I was using hyperbole. Uh, Pat, what's hyperbole? I don't know. <laughs> the hyperbole, Pat. <laughs> right. Hyper it's a, it happens every year right after the Super Bowl. Yeah, it's where the the winner of the Super Bowl plays a match with the winner of the World Series and, <laughs> and the World Cup. Yes, one giant yes, free for all of of basketball flip, from the fi- well, they from the hit a, film they, basketball. They flip a three sided coin to figure out which sport they're going to play. That would be amazing. Um, <laughs> three sided coin, yeah, that would be amazing. Well, you can get a three sided die. They exist. They've been in use that since uh, Egyptian times. As oh, very you true, know, Pat. I do know why really I need to tell college. you about it. <laughs> Speaking of dice, did you hear that like the possibly the oldest sided or oldest twenty sided die was discovered? No, I did not. Yeah, I, I can't remember the details. But it was carved out of stone, and it definitely <laughs> well, has twenty for, sides. Thank you for mentioning it. Then. No problem. Well, you know, I don't have a lot to say about it all for twist. <laughs> well, um, <coughs> cinematically, I'm waiting for you to film just the like next bit. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, cinematically, just like Great Expectations, a very beautiful film, a very very expert use of shadow and but I, of light. Again, I also think The Great Expectations was prettier. Yeah. Maybe because well, of I the think... open air elements of the design. You know what I mean? Like the, maybe, the setting maybe. is so open air, it works very well with those his style. Whereas yeah. this one sometimes was almost t- t- too tight in. Everything felt yeah, well, with the shadows yeah. and stuff, it's like... Being in London. Being in London, it's a very tight Yeah, scene. I'm not going to lie, I also watched it on my phone. <laughs> so that could have something to do with it. That might have something to do with the tightness. Um, <laughs> but I held it really great, close to man. my face. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, like like in like in the opening to Great Expectations, we get almost a, a, a sort of horror movie setup with the storm and the woman running. Uh, through the marsh. <laughs> yeah. Which, by the way, that was really weird too. Like. Yeah. Again, the setup of Great Expectations felt a little more natural. This one felt like, yeah. this one felt like a soundstage. Yeah. Well, that's I think I think because uh, the soundtrack here was very quiet, especially compared to the rest of the movie. Um, you know, we just kind of had thunder. Um, yeah. And and even until until she's giving birth, until she gives birth, really the first thing we hear is all of her crying. And that's five ten minutes in. And but I can accept that as a as a choice. I don't. Yeah. I, there's something about that scene didn't feel <clears throat> as smooth and as natural as yeah. Great Expectations. I mean, like Great Expectations, you could see we were on a soundstage many times, mm-hmm. but it didn't feel yeah. like a soundstage. Whereas this yeah. one, I was like, "There's a lady running in water on the soundstage." Is what it <laughs> felt like. Who's this lady? Yeah. The, and the set. The sets felt a lot more like sets. Yeah, <clears throat> in this movie, uh, one thing one thing in that first scene though that they did I think better than Great Expectations is when the uh, when the porter or whatever comes out to let her into the workhouse <laughs> and he's got the lantern. Uh, yeah. If you'll remember in Great Expectations, every time someone was lit by candlelight, they, had they were a actually spotlight lit on their by face. a really terrible bright spotlight on their face. Uh, the the lantern light looked a lot more natural. That's this, true, but I, at the same time, when she rang the <clears> thing, <throat> I kind of, whenever somebody rings a doorbell or a bell to summon yeah. somebody in a movie, <clears throat> my brain automatically goes into count the seconds mode. Because I always <laughs> find it amusing that apparently every single movie where there's a porter has Igor for a porter. Because the yes. man shows up in five seconds. Yes. Like, was he quick. standing next to the door? Why couldn't she just say hello? Right. This is always a thing I do in every film, including doorbells, too. I can't help it because it's like when in, in the somehow in the movie world, everybody has. Have you ever read any of the um, the Terry Pratchett Discworld? Books? No, I have not. Well, um, whenever there is an they have a, a they have a Igor's are a or Igor, sorry, I now I'm switching to Young Frankenstein for some reason. Uh, <laughs> e- Igors are a like separate race, and they have this kind of ability to just show up behind somebody as soon as they're summoned. It's just uh, like <laughs> some sort of weird built-in racial Excellent. ability. And I, every time I see a porter or something on TV, that's what happens. I'm like, I can't help it. 
and so I noticed it, and so I'm like, oh, they have an they have an Igor, yeah, on staff at, See, the, I know, at the thing. I know how long it takes me to answer the door when the doorbell rings. Exactly, it's very... and it's not <laughs> three seconds. It's not three seconds at all. It's where are my pants? Yeah, right. It's... And like, hold on a second, I'll be down. <laughs> And so I, um, it, that always takes, I don't know, it's a its a personal thing, and it has nothing to do with the film, but I did it anyway. But yeah, the lighting was better with candlelight in general, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Although, um, for some reason, I'm going to call it Crib, Fagan's Crib was really bright compared to... Yeah, this whole, this whole movie was a lot brighter. It was, yeah. but it, it, like, Fagan's felt like it should have been darker. Yeah. Like, a lot of times I was Me. like, man, like... That's, What's that's very Dickensian of you, actually, to think that Fagans, by by nature of it being a uh, a den of thieves, well, Fagans. Well, but that's what like David Lean seems to go for in his films. Yeah. Is like this is a dark place, both moralistically yeah. and visually. And well, then for some it's, reason, it's also, Fagans' place is not at all. It's also the first place that uh, Oliver's happy. I guess and that's therefore you get true. you get a little bit of brightness. But then again, too. And in this film, we don't get a lot of chance to see him happy there. Yeah, he obviously laughs in the one manner. Time. In the manner, he's also very bright, you know. But but it's it's white and clean and you know, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I think this place is dirty. Here, but... I just felt it should have been darker. Yeah. I don't know. Great expectations. Great expectations is a movie that takes place in the dark for the most part. It yeah, is, and I is, like that. I felt that was good. thematically and and yeah. Um, and and the fact that the house is all shut up, that it it is by its nature very dark. Um, whereas this movie this movie takes place, you know, there's less of an openness, um, but they're outside. Right, they're I understand, hot. but like it's, but that's the thing is Fagan's is very much indoors, shuttered, yeah. isolated. So in my mind, when they enter that space, it should get dark. It should get dark, and it doesn't. And that, that bothers me a little bit. Like, you go into the mansion or the manor or whatever, and obviously you feel like, oh, it should be bright in here. Although they yeah. may take it to extremes. I, I not a little bit. It was a bit much. Oh, I was like, is this... Gaslighting is very... It was like, is this manor in, like, a field, like, 300 <laughs> miles away from London? I don't... It, it yeah. didn't feel like it was even in the city somehow, but... Um, <laughs> Well, I think there, I think there might be two separate houses, and we don't get a feel for that. Oh, okay. There's like his manor home, and then there's the city. When they first find him, and when you they think send those are him separate to places? the bookseller, maybe, oh. maybe I don't know. It's not really that clear, and that's kind of a problem too. Because like literally, <laughs> when I was watching that, I felt like somehow the manor house was in Georgia. Well, maybe it's like uh, maybe it's like Wayne Manor in every Batman movie ever. <laughs> It's it is simultaneously two miles from the city center and, and the forty middle miles of outside of Gotham City. <laughs> yeah, right. And somehow, <laughs> yeah, it has fourteen entrances that are all in like vastly different locations. <laughs> yes, hidden on the beach, under a waterfall, in the woods, and yet, and yet uh, somehow this estate, is all yeah. all one estate still subject to the taxes of Gotham City. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, yeah, no, I can accept this as Dwayne Manor. Sure. <laughs> Okay, yes. this is Wayne yeah. Manor syndrome. This is Wayne Manor being run by Alfred, because that's what the guy looks like. <laughs> yeah, I, I like uh, the grandpa. And he was, he was, yeah, yeah. he he played, he was very nice in his part. He was just so congenial looking. Um, One one thing that, that, and you know, we talk about the speed of this movie. Um, One place where that is very evident is, is you know, anytime speed is very evident, it, the chase scene through the streets of London. <laughs> Which I yeah. was very happy. I was very happy to see uh, our our chasing participants crash through a fruit stall. Yes, right. <laughs> I was like, wait, what? <laughs> Who did that? Why? They're running. That doesn't even make yeah, sense. No, that, it was beautiful. I kind of like the way it ends. Yes. As much as I am against child abuse, that amused me that we end in that guy's fist, yes. and then it goes dark. Yes. That was kind of that was dark. kind of awesome. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's a great way to end the scene, uh, despite the fact it's our main character getting knocked right. out. Right, I mean, that's a problem. And, he's, and he's a 10-year-old child. Right, right, and this guy is so proud that he just punched a child in the face. <laughs> yes. Which also is amusing. I, I mean, that, that little scene is, yeah. That's uh, that's Victorian England for yeah. you. You can be very proud. You can be very proud of the street urchin in the face. the hell out of a child. 
Um, I like the orphanage scenes, uh, especially in that our establishment of the orphanage pans across all the walls where it's painted "God is just, God is good." Yeah, I like that. Um, that was that was as, nice. That's their wallowing poverty. That was, you know, that's not just. That's not necessarily just lean editorializing. That's you know that's the sort of thing that's Dickens, Dickens would have done. Dickens that's the sort of and Dickensian. Yeah, that's that's the, that's the sort of thing that would have happened in reality. You know, people talking about how, you know, even even more so than today, oh, the, yeah. the idea that the the elite are are somehow more blessed or somehow more virtuous, uh, just by nature of having the money. <laughs> yeah, and and well, and I that's, think there was there's. I mean, that goes back in the to Calvinism. Other that's, that's... Dickens things I've read, there is a certain <laughs> bent towards that, almost yeah. kind of like yeah. that juxtaposition between yeah. putting children you know, or it's... somebody into abject poverty and then like telling them how yeah. wonderful God is, in the yeah. in the basically and the it, same breath. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, you know it's played it's always played for irony that these people are are our bad people talking about how. God is just to to make them rich and this guy poor. Yeah. But uh you know, it's it's always it's still fun to Although see. Although I yeah. really <laughs> like the scene where they're watching those guys eat. I thought yes. that was an amazing scene. Watching that's, those that's these done these, very well. these guys just in these I guess I don't know if they're supposed to be like the heads of the orphanage. I'm not, I assume, you know just, just animalistically tearing into this food. Yeah. While the kids it's watch. again completely unclear why there are so many people involved in that. <laughs> it's yeah. not. It's it, it doesn't. It doesn't seem like it's a staff dinner because everyone's very well dressed. It, it might be the board of trustees or something. Yeah, it's a but... bit. It's a bit weird because the women don't seem like they're dressed to match the men. Yeah, the women seem to be like the maids at the place, and the men yeah. seem to be yeah, the board be of directors. It's weird. It's yeah. confusing. Either way, though, well, the nurses, the nurses probably wanted to address that. that the, yeah, this, it, I the think they, it's weird. The marms. Yeah, it was a I bit just like the odd. Word marm. It, yeah. it 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 did illustrate the point quite well, and I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. Um, another scene where where the lighting was really great uh, in my mind. Um, I already talked <laughs> about only the in your mind. <laughs> only in my mind. No, no, the lighting was really great uh, when they tell him to go sleep in the shop. Uh, when he first gets to the Undertaker's oh, house, oh yeah, your bed, your bed will be under the counter. It's through this door. Go in, and and they send him in with just a single lantern, and into you know, a room see... filled with coffins. <laughs> we finally we see the reveal of the coffins everywhere. Yeah, I, that's a good scene. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, it's 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 very this this movie, um. This movie plays very well with this sort of childlike wonder. We experience things as as all. Of yeah, it does a very good them. job of that. It, well, it's weird. This yeah. movie is a lot. And again, of, the source material. This movie is a so. lot of very good scenes, just in my yeah. mind shoved a little bit too close together. No, I think you're absolutely right. Like um, every individual scene is wonderful. There's not any that I really think like, oh, that was st- stupid or I didn't like that, except for yeah, yeah, not really. No. But, but like, just no spacing between yeah. them. Yeah, I can't think of an individual scene where where I didn't like. And looking looking through my notes, it's a bunch of oh, I really like this scene. Oh, I really yeah. Like that's this I scene. mean, that's my yeah. memory from watching. It's like oh, every yeah. I mean, it, everything was great. It's just not paced well, and just yeah. and a few other minor complaints about just we're not we don't develop the characters in a way that makes us know who they are yeah. and what they're going to do. Yeah. And, you know, at the same time, that's, again, us experiencing the world as Oliver is experiencing. That's true, it's too. These, these strangers coming in. I, and I don't necessarily feel like that was necessarily purposeful. You know, because we see enough we see enough of the action where it's it's not just Oliver being our narrator. You know, we see, we yeah, see things exactly. take place yeah, we that, see things that, he that he's not involved with. with. Which, yeah. that would make for it's a not really like, interesting adaptation of this to see, just to see, to see it, it only from, from his him. perspective would be very fascinating uh, speaking of really interesting uh, really interesting adaptations just on a quick side note uh, Will Eisner wrote a graphic novel called Fagin the Jew uh, which is really great really uh, and it's 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 basically the story from Fagin's perspective it, I will um, have to look into that that sounds yeah, very you, interesting you, you, uh, highly recommended um, anyway uh, you know it's 
That's for you listening. To a certain extent. Yeah. To a certain extent, um, the movie is, is very much all over, you know, perspective. And there, is, because of that, we can understand the problem with the narrative, with, with understanding who other people are. But I don't are. feel like but that's a thing time. that they try. Yeah, I think, at the same yeah. time, yeah. I, like, I with like certain things like the coffin either. room and stuff, you're like, oh, we're seeing yeah. the world. We're seeing it as he sees it. it. These yeah. are these terrifying yeah. monstrous coffins that are probably only yeah. about five feet long. Uh, yeah. But, you know, it becomes a. But it's another issue when it's characters. Uh, yeah. Because and you, know you what? don't feel like the characters are necessarily multi dimensional. Yeah. And that, that, that interpretation would play well. With you know why Fagin's brighter, why the manor is so heavenly, you know it's 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 the happy times and they're right. brighter, and that and the not so happy times are darker, and that's you know that's fine. Yeah, I can you accept know, I can, that too. I can understand. I can accept that they did that on purpose, but but the characterization, I can't. I think they tried to they tried to be more conservative, they, and they uh, with with what was going on and how many people were happening, and there's just too much plot. Yeah, there's um, too much plot that happens that where you can't happened. figure out why it's happening, yeah. and that and that. Yeah. So it, it's a beautiful movie with a kind of a little bit shoddy yeah. writing. Yeah, and you know say, the scenes. There's not a lot of long scenes. Yeah, um, and I think that yeah, that's probably um, part of it too. It, yeah, things are like happen and just they're over. Yeah, and, yeah. and yeah. it's uh, you know normally I might say that to say the longer scenes feel out of place. And they don't here, you know? No, the because longer it's scenes not, feel like it's that's not what like the whole movie's... movie should be like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Be. It's not like the movie's rushing to get us to the longer scenes, you know? And because the longer scenes, they're also, it's the chase sequence is like a 10 minute scene. And, and the, after the end where they're on the roof is, is, you know, it's a long, yeah, scene. but I like that and, scene. You know, yeah, it's a good it's, one. That scene's, that scene's longer to, to give it more of a sense of drama. Yeah. And, and it certainly achieves it. Um, but yeah, there's not a lot of... Yeah, but most of the scenes are real. Yeah, you're right. Very quick. Like, they, they're they yeah. over almost as soon as they start. Um, yeah. Our bar the scene's the other the... really long one. Like, we have the bar scene, the yeah. roof scene, and the chase scene, and not a lot of other really yeah. long ones. Yeah, they're, they're important plot points as far as the, you know, there are people out to get Oliver for whatever reason. But... Again, all through those, all I can say is for whatever yeah, reason. Yeah, and that and that's the <laughs> feeling I had most of the time. I'm like, yeah. why are these people doing this to him? Yeah. Like, I don't feel any reason. And like, I can kind of understand Fagin's original motivation, where he's like, oh, they're gonna, he's gonna rat us out. This is a problem. Yeah, I can yeah. Under, that. That's Fagan, an acceptable. Fagan the that, I can accept that as a reasonable motivation for a bat, an essentially evil character. Uh, yeah. but. Then we get in as soon as that other extra guy is what we who we have decided to call Murdoch, uh, is introduced. It becomes so muddled and dark and confusing about like who, what's going on. You know, don't look it up. Murdoch is fine. My my keyword's too. Yeah, low. especially you're not allowed to look anything up. <laughs> anyway, people yeah. are, I think they're getting into a car accident while they're listening to this. Um. No, I, I could look him up, but I don't want to. Um, it starts yeah. with an M. I'm sure of that. Although I'm going to feel like an idiot if I find out it's something else. I think you're probably wrong, but I can't remember. Anyway. Um, yeah, but the point is is that, yeah, it's... Yeah, so basically, we're, we're that's the point. That's what we're stuck on. That's the thing of the movie. Is yeah. It's a beautiful, great movie with kind of mediocre writing that uh, doesn't let us know why people are doing the things they're doing. Which yeah. is a problem. I mean, that's a fundamental problem in the film that Great Expectations didn't suffer from. And I don't yeah. know if maybe the writing in Great Expectations and writing between uh, in uh, Oliver Twist are of Dickens, the actual original Dickens writing, are that vastly different. I don't know. Because I've never read Oliver Twist um. and I read mo- some of Great Expectations <laughs> 12 years ago. You read the... You read the I have notes. never once in my entire life read Cliff Notes. Thank you very much. Okay, Spark. No, no nothing. I've never done. I've never done any of that. I skim, and then talk to people. Oh, 
I make I, I make Adam tell me what happened to the book. <laughs> I think that's I, I that did is, that several that times is, in, that is high in school. High school that yeah. Is, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't like I don't like being forced to read. I'm fine if I do it on my yeah. own, but don't ask me to do something because you want me to do it. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, um, but are they? I mean, do you think the stories are that vastly different? That like a an adaptation by the same person with the same general style, one would be very excellently told and the other one would be is Oliver Twist just a really shitty book <laughs> I, I'm really I don't it it, it, considering how insanely well known it is I would think not well but... I feel like I, I feel like in Great Expectations a lot of what got cut was peripheral it wasn't necessarily important yeah to okay because yeah a lot of stuff happens in Great Expectations that is not yeah. <laughs> actually relevant <laughs> Or me. <laughs> no, that that's absolutely yeah. true. That's absolutely yeah. true. Like the the fight with the, um, we mentioned this last time. Uh, there's there's an extended, you know, they eventually get into a fist fight, but there's this rivalry with another apprentice at the blacksmith shop that's completely cut from the movie, and it doesn't do a lot for the story right. it's just, it doesn't it's, do anything for the story it does a little bit for characterization a lot of words yeah. to make us living yeah. yeah it's 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 fine for characterization of of joe or whatever his name is and for characterization of our main characters um but it's not it's not plot important unfortunately oliver twist is a little tighter in its writing in that everything that happens a lot of what happens a lot of what happens is kind of plot important Mm. and you know it's a very twisty story you know the people there's conspiracies about his parentage um so it's it's everybody knows something or someone in this book there's no there's no compartmentalizing right yeah things are all mixed up together and happening Intercon- yeah. in an interconnected way and I can see well, yeah. so you can't, that out as you can't just happen to us in this story yeah yeah. you can't just cut out a full compartment um, so because there's no full compartments it's all one compartment whereas in Great Expectations there was that sort of compartmentalization in a lot of so I would you know, guess in a yes. manner of speaking that's why what makes this not a great movie is what makes it that a better book probably yeah, because yeah. you can't excise chunks of the book. Yeah, it's it's harder to to accurately excise chunks of the book, and you know everybody who's adapted from Oliver the musical down you know to the two thousand five adaptation of Richard Dreyfuss as Fagin. <laughs> which um, I have on my my bookshelf that I've never watched. <laughs> the the no, musical two thousand whatever two thousand no oh, the two thousand five with Richard Dreyfuss. You think? Um, I don't think I've ever actually watched the whole thing, so yeah. I, I I have a very specific memory of his face as Fagin, and he doesn't. He's he's. Does he have a gigantic he's nose? Like he already looks Jewish, but he doesn't. He doesn't look as. He doesn't look as caricature as Crookshank's drawing. Uh, caricature as as Alec Guinness right. does in this movie. Um, but yeah, uh, he still he still plays him as a Jewish character, and it's you know you can't really. That's it's, the source material. You gotta kind of... a de- it's a defining feature, but you know you can't. You don't necessarily need to uh, go fully down that rabbit hole <laughs> yeah, right. as as much as this movie did. Uh, man, oh man. <laughs> okay, so I mean, I guess we. That's about it, right? I mean, like that's that's a well. One more thing: the dog was a really great actor. Yeah, the dog did an excellent job. <laughs> The dog did an excellent job a, cowering in fear and trying scratching to get yeah, out. Yeah, like dog's one of the better actors. The dog because the like better. his motivations are so clear. It's true. He's a dog. Yeah, he doesn't want yeah. to die. He's a he dog. doesn't want anybody to hit He's him scared. with a big rock. <laughs> yeah. Or drown him in a in a lake. Well I think they, the two were interrelated. <laughs> I think it was gonna be rock and then lake. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's true. It's true. So he runs away. Um yeah, I, I like he, the he mob. Stays, too. He stays with his master surprisingly long. The mob. Yeah, I enjoyed the mob. I liked how <laughs> insanely huge that mob got. But yes, this was a yes, lot everyone, of extra. Every, this is the entire freaking city that we saw. Every everyone in London decided they needed to chase. This yeah, guy. right. And like, <sighs> I understand maybe like, I yeah. Was that was, it, that was a sur- 
That was a surprising bit of camaraderie. <laughs> yeah, right. Whenever, whenever there was a mob involved, you know, somebody yells that their bookstore. Hey, hey that kid a stole me. Outside yeah, their yeah, stole from me, and then like there's so, forty five. So forty people, people yeah. start chasing him. <laughs> yes. And, and, yes. And like, and then a stranger punches him in the face. Yeah. Right. Like, and and you know I. And I thought, I kept thinking the entire time we saw the mob, like, because it went from kind of like, oh, the police are out looking for him to like, this angry, two hundred man mob is chasing this guy down. And I'm like, did the grandfather? Because he, the grandfather, offers it a, a a reward at the very end. I feel like he maybe needed yes. to offer a reward a little bit earlier to make the, to make the well, then the then the mob would have been mob make more sense. Then it would have been all of England. Right, right, it's 50, terrible. fifty. Whatever it is, fifty pounds or whatever, to the man who yes. brings me the head of John the Baptist. No, wait, no. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't. It's, a, it's a pretty cheap silver platter, actually. Yeah, right. Yeah, if, yeah I don't. I don't know what a pound is worth <laughs> but, at this time. Anyway, yeah, let's not bother to look up. No, the, we are uh, certainly not looking at exchange rates. <laughs> the history of exchange rates. All right. Um, yeah, uh, I think I think we've, said we've talked that about what. Said, Adam. Yeah, uh, so this movie, uh, it's too fast. Uh, Alec Guinness is too Jewish. No, no, no. And, Alec, Guinness is, uh, Alec Guinness is too too nineteen twenties caricature of of a Jewish man. Jewish. Yes, it's it's too. Uh, he bears no resemblance yeah, to any Jewish too, man I've ever met. He is far far too European opinion of the Jews in the forties. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Which is terrible because this was forty eight, right. and the European be... opinion of the Jews was supposed to have changed after uh, World War Two. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, it really seems like he's he's more of a like a bad newspaper pen and ink drawing, like nineteen thirty eight yeah. Nazi Germany yeah. pen and ink drawing of a yeah. Jewish uh, of the conniving yeah, Jew, he is, always wringing his hands. And he's a nineteen forty eight, and we've all moved on a little bit. So yeah, yeah. And that's that's one reason that it's especially bad, I think. And I'm sure that's one of the I reasons think, I, why I, everybody was a yeah. little bit upset when Yeah. The Anti Defamation League definitely has has a good argument against yeah. that portrayal. Do you, oh, think, do you oh. think David Lean's maybe just an anti Semite? Or is it Al Gibbs? Maybe he is British. No. Nah, he didn't pick that yeah, makeup, probably. right? So nah. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> he's, he like, he's like, he, he seems to, oh god, now I have this really up, like upsetting throughout, image. Throughout his movies, he seems to, of him like showing up on set. Like <laughs> he's like, uh, so here's what I was like. David Leeds like, so here's what I'm thinking. And he's like, no, don't worry, I already brought all my. He just stuff. walks in and costs. Yeah, like I already brought all my own stuff. I got, I had this stuff at the house. It's got the huge nose, the hair. I like, to, I like to imagine, I like to imagine Alec Guinness does that for all his. <laughs> Shows up so. pre wardrobe, and makeup. Yeah, he he actually built his own lightsaber. Yeah, right. Like yeah. I made these robes at home. <laughs> this is just what I wear now. <laughs> I'm a character uh, actor, for God's sake. I have to. Uh, on that delightful image of Alex, <laughs> he is a bad man. Uh, <laughs> uh, next week we'll be talking about uh, a very early documentary, uh, the first full length documentary, uh, Nanook of the North." Robert J. I don't Flatter, know about the word documentary. Uh, 1922 either. and. Uh, uh, we'll talk about we that will next certainly time. get into that. Yes. All right. Yeah, we'll see you, see you next, next time. time. Thanks for listening. Bye.
You've been listening to Lost in Criterion, a production of With Two Brains. The show is hosted by Adam Glass and John Patrick Owatari Dorgan. Jonathan Hape did the music, and Adam Glass also edited it all together. Feel free to contact us by email via lostincriteria at withtwobrains.com or join us on the web at www.lostincriteria.com.